you mentioned that we really don't understand much. Like there's mystery all around us. Yes. If you had to like bet money on it, like what percent? So like say a million years from now, the story of science mm. and uh, human understanding, understanding that uh, started on earth is written. Like what chapter are we on? Are we like, is this like 1%, 10%, 20%, um, 50%, 90%? How much do we understand? Like the big stuff, not not like the details of like like big important questions, yeah, and ideas. I think we're in our twenties, and twenty percent of the twenty. No, like age wise, let's say we're in our twenties, but the lifespan is going to keep getting longer. You can't do that. I you can. can. You, can. you know why I use that though? I'll tell you why. <laughs> Uh, why my brain went there is because, uh, you know, anybody that gets an education in physics, yeah. you know, has this sort of trope about how all the great physicists did their best work in their 20s. Uh, and then you don't do any good work after that. And I always thought it was kind of funny because for me, physics uh, is um, is not complete. It's not nearly complete. But most physicists think that we understand most of the structure of reality. And so I... I think I, I actually, I think I put this in the book somewhere, but like this idea to me that societies would discover everything while they're young is very consistent with the way we talk about physics right now. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think that's actually the way that things are going to go. And you're, you're finding that people that are making major discoveries are getting older in some sense than they were. And our lifespan is also increasing. So I think there is something about age and your ability to learn and how much of the world you can see that's really important over a human lifespan, but also over the lifespan of societies. And so I don't know how big the frontier is. I don't actually think it has a limit. I I don't believe in infinity as a physical thing, but I think as a, a receding horizon, I think because the universe is getting bigger, you can never know all of it. Well, I think it's about... 1.7%. 1.7, where and does that come and from? it's a finite, I don't know, I just made it up. But it's like- That number had to come from somewhere. It certainly, I think seven is the thing that people usually pick. 7%? So I, I wanted to say 1%, but I thought it would be funnier. Yeah, To I add see. a point, you know, so yeah. humor, inject a little humor in there. So the seven is for the humor, one is for how much mystery I think there is out there. 99% mystery, 1% known. In terms of like really big, important questions. Yeah. It's like the list, say there's going to be like 200 chapters, like the stuff that's going to remain true. But you think the book has a finite size. Yeah, yeah. And I don't. I mean, it, it, not that I believe in infinities, but I don't, I think the size of the book is growing. Well, the fact that the size of the book is growing is one of the chapters in the book. Oh, there you go. Oh, we're we're being recursive. <laughs> <laughs> I think you have to. You can't. You can't have an ever growing book. Yes, you can. You, I mean, you just. I mean, I don't even. Because then, well, you couldn't have been asking this at the origin of life, right? Because obviously, like, you wouldn't have been, existed at the origin of life. Right. But like, the question of intelligence and artificial general, like, those questions did not exist then. Mm -hmm. And so, and they in part existed because the universe invented a space for those questions to exist through evolution. Yep. But like, I think that question will still stand a thousand years from now. It will, but there will be other questions we can't anticipate now yeah, that we'll maybe, be asking. Yeah, and maybe we'll develop the kinds of languages that will be able to ask much better questions. Right, or like, like the theory of uh, like gravitation, for example. Like when we invented that theory, like we only knew about the planets in our solar system, Right. And now, you know, many centuries later, we know about all these planets around other stars and black holes and other things that we could never have anticipated. So, and then we can ask questions about them. Um, you know, like we wouldn't have been asking about singularities and like, can they really be physical things in the universe several hundred years ago? That question couldn't exist. Yeah, but it's not, I still think those are chapters in a book. Like, I don't get a sense from that. So, do you think the universe has an end? If you think it's a book with an end. I think the number of words required to describe how the universe works has an end, yes. <laughs> Meaning, like, I don't care if it's infinite or not. 
Right. As long as the explanation is simple and it exists. Oh, I see. And I think there is a finite explanation for each aspect of it. The yeah. consciousness, the life. Yeah. Um, I mean, very probably there's like some, the black hole thing is like, what's going on there? Oh, Where's that going? So like, where do they, here. what? And then, you know, why the Big Bang? Like, what? Right. It's, it's probably there's just a huge number of universes and it's like universes you think inside so? universe. I think universes inside universes is maybe possible. I just think it's, it, um, every time we assume this is all there is, <laughs> it, it turns out there's much more. The universe is a huge place. And we mostly talked about the past and the richness of the past, but the future, I mean, with um, with many worlds, interpretation of quantum mechanics. So, Oh, I'm the, not a many the, worlds person. You're not. No. Nope. Are you? <laughs> How many Lexes are there? Depending on the day. Well, Do some uh, of them wear yellow jackets? At the, mom at the moment <laughs> we asked the question, there was one. Uh, at the moment I'm answering it, there's now in, in, in near infinity, apparently. Um, I mean, the future is... Is the future is bigger than the past, yes? Yes. Okay. I well, there you so. go. But in the past, according to and you, it's already the, gigantic. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, that's consistent with many worlds, right? Because like there's this constant branching. So, but it doesn't really have a directionality to it. Cause it's, it's a, I don't know, many worlds is weird. So my interpretation of reality is like, if you fold it up, like all that bifurcation of many worlds and you just fold it into the structure that is you and you just said you are all of those many worlds and like that sort of, you know, like like your history like converged on you, but you're like you're, you're actually an object exists that's like that, you know, was selected to exist and you're self-consistent with the other structures. So like the quantum mechanical reality is is not the one that you live in. It's this very deterministic uh, classical world. And you're carving a path through that space. But I don't think that you're constantly branching into new spaces. I think you are that space. Wait, so to you at, at the bottom, it's, it's deterministic. It's I thought you said the universe. No, is, it's, it's random, random at random. the bottom, right? But like this randomness that we see at the bottom of reality that is quantum mechanics, I think like people have assumed that that is reality. And what I'm saying is like all those things you see in many worlds, all those versions of you, just collect them up and bundle them up. And like, they're all you. And what has happened is, you know, like elementary particles don't have, they don't live in a deterministic universe, the things that we study in quantum experiments. They live in this fuzzy random space. But as that structure collapsed and started to build structures that were deterministic and evolved into you, you are a very deterministic microscopic macroscopic object. And you can look down on that universe that doesn't have time in it, that random structure. Um, and you can see that all of these possibilities look possible, but they don't look, they're not possible for you because you're constrained by this giant like causal structural history. Um, so you can't live in all those universes. You'd have to go all the way back to the very beginning of the universe and retrace everything again to be a different you. So where's the source of the free will for the macro object? Um, it's the fact that you're a deterministic structure living in a random background. And also all of that selection bundled in you allows you to select on possible futures. So that's where your will comes from. And there's just always a little bit of randomness because the universe is getting bigger. And, you know, like uh, this idea that the past is and the present is not large enough yet to contain the future. The extra structure has to come from somewhere. <laughs> um, and some of that is because outside of those giant causal structures that are things like us, it's fucking random out there. <laughs> and it's scary. And we're all hanging on to each other because the only way to hang on to each other, like the only way to exist is to like cling on to all of these causal structures that we happen to co-inhabitate existence with and try to keep reinforcing each other's existence. All the selection bundled well, in. And us, but, but free will is totally consistent with that. I don't know what I think about that. That's complicated to imagine. Uh, Just that little bit of randomness is enough. Okay. Well, it's also, it's not just the randomness. There's two features. One is the randomness helps generate some novelty and some flexibility. But it's also that, like, because you're, you're, you're the structure that's deep in time, you have this combinatorial history that's you. And uh, I think about time and assembly theory, not as linear time, but as combinatorial time. So if you have all of this structure that you're built out of, you 
in principle, you know, your future can be combinations of that structure. You obviously need to persist yourself as a coherent you. So you want to optimize for a common, like a, a, a future in that combinatorial space that still includes you um, most of the time for most of us. Um, and, um, and when you make those kinds, of, and then that gives you a space to operate in. Uh, and that's your sort of horizon where your free will can operate. And your free will can't be instantaneous. So for like exa- example, like I'm sitting here talking to you right now, I can't mm-hmm. be in the UK and I can't be in Arizona, but I could plan, I could execute my free will over time because free will is a temporal feature of life uh, to be there, you know, tomorrow or the, or the next day if I wanted to. But what about like the uh, instantaneous decisions you're making? Like to, I don't know, to put your hand on the table. That's. I think those were already decided a while ago. I don't think they're, they're, I don't think free will is ever instantaneous. But on a longer time horizon, yep. there's some kind of steering going on. Mm-hmm. And who's doing the steering? You are. Mm. And you being this macro object that's encompasses. Or you being Lex. <laughs> Whatever you want to call it. <laughs> There, there you are assigning <laughs> words to things once again. I know. <laughs>